In this video, we'll solve a real-world problem with the iPhone 16's battery. And along the way, we'll break down how batteries work in everyday devices, from charge to power, in a simple and fun way. The iPhone 16 comes with a 3,561 mAh lithium-ion battery and a nominal voltage of 3.88 volts. It charges from 0 to 100% in just 2 hours using a fast charger. Based on that, we'll first calculate the average charging current, then the average power delivered during charging. Now flip the scenario. When the phone is idle, with the screen off and Wi-Fi on, it draws just 10 milliamps. So for the third part, we'll figure out how long the battery would last in that low power state. We're not just going to solve these problems. I'll walk you through the real physics behind them. You'll see where the formulas come from, what they really mean, and how everything from voltage to current and power connects in everyday devices like your phone. Let's start with the basics. Every battery has two terminals, a positive side and a negative side. The negative side is packed with tightly crammed electrons, creating a lot of electron pressure. On the other hand, the positive side has far fewer electrons, resulting in much less electron pressure. This difference in electron pressure or potential difference is what we refer to as the voltage of the battery. Because of this potential difference, the electrons on the negative side are eager to move over to the positive side. It's like a crowd of people trying to move from a packed room to a spacious one. Now let's give those electrons a path using a conductor. When we connect the two sides of the battery, electrons start moving from the negative side to the positive side. This movement of electrons is called a negative current. But remember, since we don't like negative things, we refer to the current as flowing from positive to negative. So while the electrons are actually moving from the negative side to the positive side, we say the conventional current flows from the positive side to the negative side. But there's no point in just letting electrons flow freely. We want to get some work done with their movement. So let's connect a light bulb to our battery. Now we have a complete circuit. The electrons are happy because they can travel to a less pressured area. And we're happy because we get useful work done, like lighting up a bulb. It's a win-win situation. In electronics, what we're actually doing is applying an electron pressure difference and letting electrons move to a low pressure area, making them do some work along the way. Isn't that smart? Now you may wonder, how long does this electron movement last? As electrons leave the negative side, the electron pressure there gradually decreases. Meanwhile, electrons gather on the positive side, increasing the pressure there. Over time, the pressures on both sides equalize, eliminating the pressure difference. When this happens, the voltage drops to zero, and we say the battery is dead. Let's zoom in on the concept of voltage. Imagine dropping a one kilogram weight from two different heights. Which one hits the ground with more force? The one that started higher, of course because it had more potential energy. Voltage works the same way. It's like height for electrons. The greater the voltage, the more energy each electron carries to do useful work. When a weight falls, its potential energy turns into kinetic energy, which then becomes sound and heat when it hits the floor. That total energy is the work it did. The same idea applies to electricity. When electrons flow through a light bulb, their electrical energy is converted into light and heat. That energy, the work, comes from the voltage. Now, how do we define voltage? As we discussed earlier, we can apply an electron pressure difference and let electrons move to a low pressure area, making them do some work along the way. If the potential difference is large, electrons move strongly from high pressure to low pressure, allowing us to do a lot of work. If the potential difference is small, electrons are less likely to move, so they can only do a small amount of work. Thus, the amount of work that electron movement can produce is a measurement of its potential difference. If the movement of Q coulombs of charge creates W amount of work, we can define the voltage as V equals to W over Q. In simple terms, this tells us how much work is done by just one coulomb of charge as it moves through the circuit. When a component has one volt across it, it means that each coulomb of charge 
passing through it converts one joule of electrical energy. I think you now have a clear idea of what voltage is. Now let's move on to the current. We define the amount of current by counting how many electrons flow through the conductor per second. If Q coulombs of charge pass through in T seconds, then the current is simply the amount of charge divided by the time it takes. The unit of current is called amperes, or simply amps. One ampere equals one coulomb moving past a point per second. That means to create a one ampere current flow, 6.2 quintillion electrons have to flow through a single point of the conductor every second. It may seem like a huge number of electrons, but at the atomic scale, that's how things are, so don't be surprised. Now we are going to talk about electrical power. Consider this simple circuit. When we apply a voltage V across the light bulb, a current I starts to flow through it. Let's assume the light bulb does not waste energy and converts all the energy it uses into light. If within the time T, Q amount of charges pass through the circuit and perform W amount of work, we can use the definitions of current and voltage. Current is simply the amount of charge divided by the time it takes. Voltage is the amount of work done per coulomb of charge. In physics, we define power as the rate of doing work, or the amount of work done each second. Since W amount of work is done on the light bulb during time T, the power consumed by the light bulb is equals to the W divided by T. Now we have three equations, but there are many variables. Let's try to simplify these and develop the relationship among power, voltage, and current using these equations. Let's multiply the equations one and two. We get that the voltage times current is equal to the work divided by time. This is our fourth equation. Pay attention to the equations three and four. Those are equal. So we can say the power consumed by an electrical device is equal to the voltage across it times current through it. This is a crucial relationship in electronics, allowing us to understand and calculate the power requirements and consumption of various devices and circuits. Now, if the resistance of this light bulb is R, using Ohm's law, we can derive two other useful forms of this equation. We measure this power using a unit called watts. If any electrical device consumes one joule of electrical energy every second, we say that the device consumes one watt of power. All these equations may seem a bit complex at first, but watch carefully and you will understand how these equations are derived. There's one last piece of the puzzle we need to understand before solving our battery problem. Earlier, we mentioned that as a battery powers a device, its voltage slowly drops. But here's something important. You should never let a battery fully discharge down to zero volts. For lithium ion batteries, that's a very bad idea. It can damage the battery, reduce its lifespan, or even make it unsafe. That's why every battery has safe charging and discharging limits, a voltage range where it operates reliably and safely. Lithium iron batteries like the ones in the iPhone 16, the voltage ranges from about 4.2 volts when fully charged down to around 3.3 volts when it's time to recharge. The average working voltage, which we use in calculations, is typically around 3.88 volts. This is called the nominal voltage. Now, what exactly is battery capacity? As I mentioned earlier, for safe battery operation, we need to keep the voltage within certain limits. The highest voltage the battery can safely reach is labeled as 100% charge, and the lowest safe voltage is labeled as 0% or fully discharged. We should only use the battery within this range. Going outside, it can damage the battery. So, battery capacity is a measure of how much electric charge the battery can store and deliver within those safe limits. In simple terms, it tells you how long your device can run before it needs a recharge. We can calculate a battery's capacity by multiplying the average charging or discharging current by the time it takes to fully charge or discharge. For larger batteries like the ones in cars, we measure capacity in amp hours, or AH. For smaller devices like phones, we use milliamp hours, or MAH, which is just one thousandth of an amp hour. So if a battery is rated at one amp hour, that means it can deliver one amp of current for one hour before it runs out. But pushing it beyond its limits can damage it or shorten its life. Let's look at an example. 
Take this car battery. It's labeled with a nominal voltage of 12 volts and a capacity of 50 amp hours. That means it can deliver 50 amps for one hour, 25 amps for two hours, or one amp for 50 hours, all at 12 volts. Now compare that to the iPhone 16 battery. It has a nominal voltage of 3.88 volts and a capacity of 3,561 milliamp hours. That means it could theoretically deliver 3,561 milliamps for one hour, 356 milliamps for over 10 hours, or one milliamp for 3,561 hours. But keep in mind, drawing more than the rated capacity or pushing the battery beyond its limits can damage it. So always stay within the safe range. Understanding battery capacity is key to figuring out how long a device can run or how fast it can charge. And with that, we've covered everything we need to know. Now it's time to put it all together and solve the iPhone 16 battery problem. Let's start with part A. We're told that the fast charger takes two hours to fully charge a 3,561 milliamp hour battery. The question is, what's the average charging current? Here's what we know. Battery capacity is 3,561 milliamp hours. Charging time is two hours. And what we want to find is the average current in milliamps. As we talked about earlier, capacity is just current multiplied by time. So to find the average current, we simply rearrange the formula. Current equals capacity divided by time. Plug in the numbers. So the average charging current is 1,780.5 milliamps. Now, for part B, we're asked to find the average power delivered to the battery during charging. Here's what we know. Nominal voltage is 3.88 volts, and from part A, the average charging current is 1,780.5 milliamps, and we want to find the average power in watts. The idea here is simple. Power is the product of voltage and current. Power equals voltage times current. But there's one important thing to remember. When calculating power, we need to use amperes, not milliamperes. We get the power 6.9 watts. So the average power delivered to the battery is approximately 6.91 watts during this period. Now let's move on to the final part, part C. We're estimating how long the battery will last when the phone is idle, screen off, connected to Wi-Fi, drawing just a small amount of current, and we'll express the answer in days. Here's what we know. Battery capacity is 3,561 milliamp hours. Idle current draw is 10 milliamps. What we want is battery life in days. Just like in part A, we'll use the formula. Time equals capacity divided by current. So we get the time is 356.1 hours. Now let's convert that to days. We have to divide it by 24 because a day has 24 hours. We get 14.84 days. So in this low power idle mode, the iPhone 16 battery would last for about 14.84 days. And that's it. We turn battery specs into real answers, figuring out current, power, and how long your phone can last on a single charge. Along the way, we made sense of how batteries actually work. If this helped, give it a like and subscribe for more simple science behind everyday tech. Thanks for watching. See you next time.